get your name and uh, your rank at separation? Sure, uh, Michael Holland, and I was a colonel at separation. Uh, where do you live? Live in Fairburn, Georgia, which is just south of Atlanta. We need full complete sentences like I am Mike. Oh, uh, okay. Let's try that one more time. I am Michael Holland. I retired as a colonel after 28 years service, and I live in Fairburn, Georgia, which is about 25 miles south of Atlanta. When did you enlist in the Corps? I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1963 uh, as a freshman in college. I was involved with Army ROTC and a Marine recruiter came by and I thought I would much rather be a Marine than be in the Army. So I signed up uh, for the Marine Corps at that point and then spent the summers going to boot camp. Uh, so 1963. What your family think about you joining? They were very unhappy with the decision because Vietnam had just started up and uh, my girlfriend at the time was the one that was particularly displeased. But none of that ended up mattering. What, what MOS slots did you list? Uh, well, originally uh, I was a helicopter pilot and then uh, after I got back from overseas I instructed in helicopters for a while and then transitioned to jets and then I flew single seat, single engine jets for almost 20 years. What you fly? Uh, A4s. Uh, was the jet. A4. I flew A4s and uh, I flew Hueys and I flew the H-46. What you think about flying the 46? I love flying the H-46. It was quite a machine. At first I was a little disappointed I didn't uh, get assigned to a gun squadron. But when you're a helicopter pilot, and I think this is true now just as much as it was then, you have a very close affinity for the troops on the ground. And as it turned out, flying the H-46 was the most important part of that, that whole camaraderie, that whole system. And we're there for the troops, and I couldn't have been more pleased than to have flown the H-46 for the troops. What was your favorite song during the war? No question. Hey Jude. There was nothing like getting the whole squadron together in the club, and after we've been celebrating a little while, and getting everybody together and singing Hey Jude weaving back and forth. <laughs> and to this day when I hear that song, it, uh, it's very nostalgic. How, uh, okay, uh, what was some, what were your best r r memories? Best r r memories? I went to Hawaii for r r and I was fairly newly married when I went overseas, so I guess the best memories were just being with my new wife. But I'd never been to Hawaii before, and of course the scenery is beautiful, and I enjoy that very much. But most of it's a blur now. <laughs> Any other thing I'll ask this question, I already know the answer. You ever been back? To Hawaii? Yeah. No. Really? No. Oh, I thought you would. Okay. <clears throat> um, well, tell, do you have any stories you want to share about best or worst of times? Uh, flying or you know, oh. with your friends or something about your CO or something about Duncan or just this is kind of a wraparound deal. Right. Well, I'm sure in retrospect that uh, I probably maybe didn't have it as bad as some of these other guys. And of course, as you know, we all suppress and repress a lot of memories. But I was a little bit unique, I think, myself. There are, there are really three kinds of pilots. There are pilots who, who fly, who do it as a job. And there are pilots who enjoy flying, and they do it as a job. And then there are pilots that absolutely love to fly, and I'm in the third category. And none of those means anything pro or con about your skill set or your ability, but I was one of those that absolutely loved to fly. So I think I could honestly say that there are a lot of days that were really, really good days just because of the flying. Uh, the best days, well, I have two stories. The first story uh, about the best day was, I think I must have been in my A game that day. But we were pulling out a six-man reconnaissance team, and the LZ had been overrun. And this reconnaissance team uh, was backed up at the edge of a cliff, about a 350-foot cliff. And so there was nowhere to land. There was nowhere to even put the back wheels on the top of the cliff. And uh, crew chief at the time was Mike Clausen, who is well known, who wanted to end up winning the Congressional Medal of Honor. A fabulous crew chief, and he actually talked me into a hover next to the sheer cliff. So the cliff is here, I'm hovering here, and it's about 350 to 400 feet straight down, so there's nothing to look at to keep you from going all over the place. But he kept me flying right next to that cliff. We dropped the ramp, and then the recon guys started jumping on while the bad guys were chasing them. So 
and I hear him back there, and it seemed like forever. It was probably only about five or six seconds, but I'm sitting back there, and I'm, he says, I got one, I got two, I got three, and finally we had all six on board, and, uh, and of course we peeled off and went down the valley, and the bad guys never could get a shot at us, so that was a really good day. And he came up to the cockpit, and he was clapping me on the back, and he says, I don't, Lieutenant, I don't think there is anybody that could have flown that as well as you did. And so I was all puffed up thinking I was pretty hot stuff, but then about half an hour later, it dawned on me that any of us could have done it. It just that I happened to be in that place at that time. So that was a really good day. The second thing that I remember very vividly that was a really great day was Thanksgiving of uh, 1969. And we spent the whole day flying hot meals out to the troops in the different LZs at different zones. And of course, a lot of them hadn't seen hot food and I don't know when. And we went to this one particular LZ whose, it, the name escapes me, but it was a rather small one. And it was manned only by about 12 or 13 guys. And one of the things we took to them was this great big vat of ice cream. And of course, they hadn't seen ice cream and I don't know when. And they came running down the steps. We landed and they, they started taking the food off and they knew that they had Thanksgiving dinner coming. And they saw this ice cream and it was like in a, a small uh, half barrel. And they ripped the top off this ice cream and started eating it with their hands, just grinning and just laughing. And that was a really good day for me, uh, being able to do that for the troops. And I think we got back that night probably around, oh, 18, 1900, eight, uh, seven, or seven o'clock at night. And that's when we finally got to eat, but it didn't matter because we were able to do that for them. Uh, that, that was a, a good time. Another story I like to tell uh, is when I almost got court-martialed, but that still ended up being a pretty good day. I was uh, in the maintenance department and was a, a, we called them test pilots, but actually what it was is post-maintenance inspection pilot. And we weren't supposed to do any of this stuff at night, but we had to. Uh, the next day, if you had a squadron strike ready to go, you needed to have the aircraft ready to go. So if there had been some major maintenance, for example, replacing an engine or a rotor blade, there were only a few guys who were designated after that major maintenance had taken place to fly the aircraft and be sure it was airworthy before it was released to fly in a combat mission the next day. Well, when we did this, we just had one pilot. We did not have a co-pilot, and all we had was one crew chief. So there were just the two of us. Well, this one particular night I remember, uh, I, was on, uh, I was on the hover pad and we were working, uh, working uh, an engine change, I believe it was, trying to get it all, all trimmed up like it was supposed to be. And the tower calls me up and they said, uh, whatever my call sign was, uh, Peach Bush Test, I think it was at the time, and they said, uh, we need you to call the Direct Air Support Center. So I said, well, I'm on a maintenance test. I can't, I can't call them. And they said, no, we really need you to call. So long story short, I called up the Direct Support Center and they said, we need you to go get a medevac. And I said, well, I, I've, we're not equipped to do that. We don't have any guns on board. Uh, it's just me and a crew chief. And they said, well, this is a, a, a guy, they've just been in contact, it's about 20 miles west of your position, and he has a head wound, and we need to get him out to the hospital ship, otherwise uh, he won't make it. And the regular medevac people were out on another mission. So I called up the crew chief and I said, look, here's the situation. I don't know whether it's gonna be a hot zone or not. We don't have guns, it's just you and me. Uh, I want your input, but I'm ready to go if you'll go. And he says, yes, sir, let's go. So. We did end up going. I happened to have my map with me, which is fortunate, otherwise I probably never would have found the zone. We went in. Fortunately, we did not take any fire. The enemy had broken off contact. And we load the guy on, and he's in very bad shape. So my crew chief is giving him first aid, and I think the corpsman jumped on with him. And so we flew out to the hospital ship, which took about 10 or 15 minutes. Well, so I land on the hospital ship, and it's at night, and the guys on the hospital ship, they see us and we land on the, on the tail end of the ship and they see there's not a co-pilot in there. Well, they think he's been shot. So they start tearing off the emergency doors and stuff, trying to get it to whoever was in the cockpit. And of course, there was nobody there. And they kind of look and then they look at me and the crew chief uh, took the uh, wounded guy, got him with a corpsman off, put the door back on and we flew back to, uh, back to the Marble Mountain. Well, I'm thinking, we can't say a word about this to anybody, uh, he and I together. So we can't say a word about this. We'll get in real trouble. I'm going into a, an LZ at night with no guns, no crew, no nothing. He says, yes, sir, we'll be quiet about it. Well, darn if somebody from the ship didn't call up the next day 
to our squadron and say, hey, thanks a lot for that medevac you guys did last night. Uh, we want you to know that that Marine lived. And I didn't know that until later when I got called into the XO's office and he was about to court martial me. And he said, you know, I ought to court martial you, put you in the brig and everything else. But he said, the guy lived, you did your job. And that was a really good day too. I like that one. <laughs> um, bad day, two stories. First one is uh, there was uh, a recon team in contact, and it was also at night, and the weather was very marginal. And a couple of them had been hit, and we went in, and the weather was very lousy. I mean, we must have shot five or six approaches trying to get in and get into that zone. Couldn't get in, kept getting driven off by the enemy and so forth. Tried and tried and tried, starting to run out of gas, uh, took a couple of hits, got into the zone finally got the guys out and neither one of them made it and I mean I just remember feeling just totally deflated it was just it was just horrible horrible feeling uh, and you can only hope that the good things you did offset the fact that for whatever reason I couldn't get in the zone sooner to maybe get him to where he needed to be where where he was alive another bad day <laughs> we have some Korean Marines on board and it's a essentially a the quintessential milk run we're taking these Korean Marines to the PX in Da Nang so they can buy stuff. They can buy toothbrush, uh, toothbrushes and razor blades and all the stuff that they buy. Well, I'm not sure if anybody has discussed the ferocity of the South Korean Marine, but let's just say it's legendary. And the local people that lived around where the South Koreans had their little base camps were in awe of them. In fact, uh, they at night, would, the local populace at night, would go out and they would dig up the, the mines or the munitions or anything that the VC had put there uh, just so the South Koreans wouldn't retaliate against them. So anyway, we're flying up to Da Nang for this, uh, this milk run to the PX. Easy mission, I'm thinking. Well, all of a sudden, a crew chief calls me up and I guess we took, a, we took a round through one of the engines and just flying down the beach, sightseeing, fat, dumb, and happy. And uh, crew chief calls me up and I heard this muffled explosion. Well, one of the engines had exploded apparently and I looked down at the gauge there and the EGT was like at a thousand degrees which is I mean totally pegged and he says put it down sir put it down so I put it down it was right next to this little village on the beach so I get it down I'm thinking well I guess I did a pretty good job getting it down but uh, then I look and I see some guys starting to come out of the tree line towards us and I'm going oh man this is gonna be something so <laughs> I couldn't think of what to do, and I thought, well, I've got these Korean Marines, so I'll just put out a perimeter. So I talked to the uh, sergeant that was in charge of the Koreans, who fortunately spoke English, and I said, you know, get them around the helicopter, get them outside. So these bad guys, I guess they're bad guys, but they're coming out of the bushes about 150, 200 meters away. They're coming towards us, and then all these Korean Marines come out of the back ramp, and they make a circle around the helicopter, and you see all these guys and uh, the whether they're bad or good, who knows, but indigenous personnel were coming towards us. They saw the Korean Marines, they stopped, and suddenly they had a pressing engagement elsewhere. They went, turned around and went back into the bushes. So that was a bad day that turned into a pretty good day. <laughs> it took us a while to get that one. Uh, they, another helicopter came and got them, and the hard part was trying to, it, trying to get the sergeant to translate her to try to explain why we weren't able to take off again and take them to the PX because a lot of them even though they saw what was going on in back couldn't understand why we just couldn't couldn't take them to the PX after they had driven off this this group just by showing up you know it's it pretty cool um, but all in all uh, it's very interesting. It's it's a very emotional experience, and beside the the brotherhood and the fellowship that you have, it's just it's a myriad of emotions in a very short period of time. Sometimes, and I, I know probably some of the other guys have said, "Well, you know, it was pretty boring," but then there were a couple of moments, and that's exactly what it is. And the story I have to illustrate that is uh, we had just dropped off uh, some troops in a zone on a strike, and I noticed out of the bushes in front of us, directly in front of us, about maybe 40, 50 yards away, a bad guy steps out from behind a couple of bushes and he points his AK-47 right at the cockpit. And I'm thinking, school's out, man, I'm dead. Uh, I mean, it just, it was like a cold shot of adrenaline to the heart. 
And I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do? And all this happens in microseconds. So I picked up the helicopter and I turned it sideways so my right gunner had a shot at him. And well, in the meantime, just as I'm starting to pick it up, this guy opens up. And I'm thinking, we're dead. That's, we're, we're done. Well, darn it, the guy didn't miss. So you go from sheer terror to turning the helicopter around. Of course, the, uh, my right gunner, who was a, a good friend of mine, uh, he used to fly with me quite often, eliminated the threat. And then we pick it up and we fly away. And I'm looking at my co-pilot. We're both laughing, saying, man, that guy was sure a lousy shot, wasn't he? <laughs> so stuff like that in the space of about maybe 30 seconds, you run through this, this gamut of emotions. And, and it's very interesting. Nothing like it ever since, even though I've been flying for 40 years now. <laughs> That's about the only stories I can think of to relate. You got anything else you want to say? You got anything about Klaus? Mike and I were, uh, were pretty close. I was the line officer, so I was in charge of, of all the crew chiefs and, and mechanics and gunners. The best job a lieutenant could have, the absolute best job a lieutenant could have. And Mike was uh, a very, very good mechanic, maybe sometimes a little unconventional. But he and I used to fly together a lot, particularly on some of the tougher missions, because as line officer, I could pick my crews. Well, I always picked him, and like the story I was telling about backing up to the cliff, I can only think of one other crew chief that have, could talk any pilot into doing that maneuver. Uh, so, but as you guys probably know, he did have his demons, and uh, but it was always my job to take care of him. So when he made some infraction of the rules, I was the one that took him to the skipper and as his officer representative and did my best to defend him. And he's quite a guy, and I, I miss him. I ran into him in uh, 2003, and I was flying a, a trip for, uh, for the airline, and the flight attendant comes up and she says, uh, either you guys in the military, and of course my co-pilot and I both had been, he was an Air Force uh, tanker driver, and I said, well, yeah. And she hands me this note, and it's uh, a note that had his name on it, it as Mike Claus, and I went, you gotta be kidding me, I hadn't seen him since 1970. So I unstrapped and went back. We hadn't taken off yet. And sure enough, there he was with his wife. He's on his way to a speaking tour. And that's unfortunately the last time I saw him. But uh, we had a chance to get reconnected. And it was just like, even like this weekend, I haven't seen some of these guys in 39 years. It's like it was yesterday. No change, except we're a little bit grayer, a little bit broader. But no change at all. Uh, so. What did you get the medal for? What, Mike? Yeah. He was on a, a mission where somehow their aircraft ended up in a minefield. There were some Marines pinned down in a minefield, and he ran off the ramp and retrieved several of the guys. I don't know what to say. Uh, it took an incredible amount of courage to do that, obviously, but he was the kind that would not even think about it. He would just do it without thinking of the consequences, whereas probably the rest of us would have gone, well, gee, I don't know, let me just think how I can get from this crater to that crater, because I know that there's no mines there. He just probably ran right straight, and I, and I can imagine him doing that. Anything else? Not unless you guys have anything. It's all the stories I want to tell. I'm just lucky to, I'm fortunate to have, I guess it can be said that I was a little bit wild in, at my, in my day as a lieutenant. and. Uh, and I had a uh, occasion at an air show not too long ago to run into some VMM-263 pilots who were flying the Osprey now. And of course, whenever I fly an air show, I wear my HMM-263 patch. And uh, so we got to talking, and it was like I was one of their squadron. Uh, they, they, for some reason, have some type of awe about, about the Vietnam guys. And that goes to the Thunder Chicken call sign, and uh, there's been some documentation about that that I think I gave you guys. But it's like I could have been a lieutenant again with those with those folks. There, there's that affinity. So you want to say something about the Thunder Chicken call sign at all? <laughs> <laughs> about five minutes on the tape. The uh, you saw the documentation that we provided. Well, this happened that weekend at the air show. Uh, there's a young lieutenant, and we started emailing back and forth, and he sent me the second Maw release about the, the Thunder Chicken thing. And apparently the, the party line was that Thunder Chicken came from a misinterpretation of the Vietnamese word for eagle. It was supposed to be Thunder Eagles. And that wasn't it at all. And unfortunately, 
for, be, for better or for worse, I was one of, the, uh, one of the instigators. And this ties into what I was saying a minute ago. You do things when you're a lieutenant that you would never consider doing later on. And I, I told all these young lieutenants, look, have fun. There's hope for you. I made colonel, so you probably will too. But uh, what happened was we had a new CO who came in and decided that the, the old gopher broke insignia was not what was accepted. That was not proper. And he went back to the old patch. Well, I was, as line officer, I was the one out there with the aircraft all the time and, and the mechanics. So the first day, they got someone who is a freehand artist, and on the forward pylon of the machine, they painted this, I guess it was supposed to be an eagle holding lightning bolts or something. Well, it was a very poor job, amateurish at best. And I came back, and I saw this thing, and I came back, and I came into the club, and, and Butch Mazuka and, uh, and Pig McRae, and a bunch of guys were sitting around, and I said, you guys ain't going to believe this. They've got a... They've got a damn chicken painted on the front pylon of our aircraft. I guess we're the thunder chickens now, I guess. So we all laughed about that for quite a while. Well, next day, so uh, I've got a flight of four, and, uh, and I call up Marble Tower, and I say, uh, our call sign was Peach Bush. That's what we were supposed to use. And I call up the tower, and I said, hey, Thunder Chicken 3-1, i got a flight of four for the hen house, something along. There's all this snickering and laughing because all the lieutenants were in on this deal. So the Marble Tower doesn't recognize a call sign. They come back and says, um, I think you need to be up Da Nang Tower, uh, say type aircraft. And I said something like, oh, we're four Fox 4s, meaning F4s, which of course we wouldn't, we, we weren't. So he gave us a frequency for Da Nang Tower. And I says, no, 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 we're H46s. And, and so this is going on. In the meantime, a couple of uh, friends of mine that were in the Cobras overhead, they were lieutenants, they start playing around with it too. And they says, hey, hey, Tower, ask the Thunder Chickens what they want, you know. And, and I said, well, I, we just want to go to the chicken coop. You know? And that's how that whole thing got started. And then all the other lieutenants picked up on it. Our CO absolutely hated the fact that we were using it. So we just waited till he wasn't flying. And then from then on, we were the Thunder Chickens. And that's the true facts. And that's how it got started. And I guess I, guess I had a hand in it. <laughs> Good story.